Hello, welcome back. It's Rafael Gutierrez, and as you can see, I grew a bit of a beard. Uh, I have been away for three weeks. Uh, I pretty much usually go to Okinawa to do my training uh, whenever I can afford it and whenever I can. And this time I was able to find a really good ticket. Uh, and usually I will mention that when I go to Okinawa, I like to go or stay after a big group goes and stays. The reason is or before a uh, big group. The reason is a lot of times I find that if I go when a hundred people show up, there's a hundred people competing to get trained by one person or a couple different people. Uh, the dojo I tend to go to, it's uh, Tamaki Sensei and uh, Tokashiki Sensei's dojo. And I'm pretty much the lowest rank there. And I'm okay with that because what it means is that as the lowest rank, I have 11 people who I can actually ask uh, questions book too, and I can actually show my training. I can see my training, and they can actually get really specific on everything. Now it makes training hard. I mean, a lot of times my teachers have said, "Well, you know, I know this. You know, this might be too hard." And what I tell them is, "If it's not hard, I'm not learning." And that's the way I actually look at it. A lot of times, people, as a college professor, a lot of times people talk about how they like this class because the professor is easy. But the truth is, what ends up happening is they're not necessarily learning anything. Now, there are some classes which, obviously, they are maybe the professor is such a good instructor that he understands how to teach the class. But when you're trying to do something physical and that's new for you, you are going to end up running into things that are hard for you to do. You have to learn how to do them. Uh, and one of, the, one of the things I found is sometimes a lot of things that we think take a lot of strength, it's not the strength, it's a technique. And it's just one of the things that I uh, wanted to I actually saw on my trip. The other thing I saw on my trip is one thing that one of my teachers told me, and he said, "Raphael, you're a strong, you're a strong man. You actually can muscle through most people and not have a problem. But eventually, is uh, your strength is going to fail. Eventually, you're going to get old enough that you can't rely on the strength. And that's what they told me they were trying to teach me is, well, once you get to a point where you can no longer no longer rely on your strength. The only thing you have to rely on is your technique. Now, that actually goes with the, one of the things a lot of people mention in martial arts, where it's, oh, well, you know, the bigger person has the advantage. And it, to a degree, it is true. But you can't grow your size. I've mentioned this before. You can't grow as soon as you need to grow. You are a certain, you do have a certain body style, and you do have to work with within the kind of confinements of your own body. If you're trying to fight like a 300 pound nothing but muscle uh professional fighter and you're a 110 pound uh engineer for instance it's going to be the techniques that work for him are not necessarily going to work for you and so that's one of the big things that my teachers have always uh, mentioned uh tava sensei i every time i go to okinawa i think about him and uh, i do try to get to his grave site and um I I think of what he told me, where it was, I have my karate, I'm going to teach you what I know. It's up to you to find your karate and go with what you know. And so that's one of the things I try to maintain, I try to maintain is the whole idea of, I have my version of how to do stuff, but I'm also going to go out and learn from anyone I can to see what's better. I'm not going to rely on just myself, and I'm not just going to stick to doing something the way it is because that's the way it is. Uh, Taba Sensei, Tamaki Sensei, Tokushiki Sensei have all told me my karate will change over time based on my understanding of what I'm doing. And if I learn from other people, their understanding, and I'll be able to mix it and take what I need and leave the rest. And that I, I think is really important in martial arts. The other thing that I will actually mention that I noticed in, uh, uh, I went to the dojo bar and I ran into a, a, lot of, a couple people one of them talked about how he had been jumping from studio to studio and eventually decided on one. And he said how he felt like he wasted a lot of time bouncing from studio to studio. He wished he would have just found one, stuck with it, and that's it. And I told him, you know, there are benefits and to bouncing around. There are some studios that are more your personality. If you go to Okinawa, you can actually talk to uh, the uh, traditional karate Kabuto Liaison Bureau. Uh, really good people to talk to, and they, they will point you to certain 
two different dojos, I'll make introductions. And if you're there for, let's say, uh, two weeks, you can bounce around. And what you'll see is you'll see what works best for you. But you won't end up getting the deep version of karate. You'll get a big superficial version of it. So you can actually look at uh, Gojiru, Wichiru, Shoru, a bunch of Shoran Rus, and see which one matches the way you like to train. Now, once you find the way you like to train, one of the big things is if you're only there for two weeks, that would mean that your first week you're running around trying to find a school, and your second week is when you decide you're going to be in this one school. And a lot of times, well, think about it. If someone comes to your school for a week and then uh, comes, you know, one day, one week, and then comes and stays for a week with you the next week, do you really spend a lot of time trying to teach them the things that you're te you're trying to teach your other students? And the answer for me is no. I'm going to take, give more time to the people who I know are going to stick around. And so you may not get as much depth as you would want, uh, bouncing around and then finding the right studio for you. But the other thing, though, that's a, that you can do is you can actually make the connections this way. And then next time you show up, you know the studio you're going to go with. You know that they're going to train. You can know who you're going to bring gifts to. You know how much it's going to cost you. And you can even talk sometimes talk to people about having one-on-one -on -one training. You will That's something you would pay extra for. But it's something that I would tell you is extremely worthwhile because you have someone, think well, think about it. If you have someone watching every move you make to uh, correct everything, you're going to get better quicker. And it's just the way it is. Yes, you can. You, know, you are going to get training. Now you're going to get training. You're going to get it a certain way. But there are some people who come in with a attitude that comes from, I guess, watching too many movies where it's, well, I want to find the guy who is going to train me because he loves teaching. Well, truth is, pretty much every martial artist I met in Okinawa loves teaching. But the thing is, why should they teach you? What have you given them to make them want to teach you? I mean, there's, think of how many people go to Okinawa a year, a, shoot, even a day trying to find the right person to teach them. Well, if you, if you haven't earned any reason for them to teach you, there's no reason for them to help you. So, yes, giving gifts, giving money is one of the important things. You are spend, They are spending their time with you, and even if they're retired and, you know, they do it for fun, you know? Think about that. If you were retired and doing karate for fun and you had someone from another country come for a week, wouldn't it be nice for them to actually say, look, you know, I value your time. Let me give you something. And that's one of the big things that uh, is important for people to realize in uh, Okinawan Karate and any martial art. Now, today I'm going to talk about the Bobishi points of the arms, uh, the ones I found. And again, one of the things I keep seeing is a lot of these points seem more important for weapons. Like the uh, ones in the arms, especially for knife fighters, I think these are spots that you, if anyone here uh, practices any sort of knife fight, knife uh, mar fighting martial arts, I think you'll be like, oh, obviously that's where you want to cut if someone is trying to do something to you. Now, I'm not going to talk about techniques. I'm just going to talk about certain points that I ended up seeing, and I'm going to use my book. Now, the first point I'm going to tell you is the armpit area. And the nice neat thing about this is I have done a video on uh, the toe kick to the armpit, which uh, Arakaki was famous for, you know, supposedly someone died. And as I looked at it, I, I saw it as a medical possibility. And I am going to use my newer book. Uh, it's still a, a work in progress, which I'm going to uh, make available, and I'll tell you more about it. But here you pretty much see the armpit. And so some people talk about kicking in there as one of the points for the Kubishi. Now, if you go inside the armpit, I, on my book I made it black and white so you could color it in. I did the arteries in red, the uh, nerves in uh, green. Now, veins are not really too important. You can really cut a vein and, you know, it'll gush, but you'll be okay. The arteries are the ones you have to be worried about. Now, if you do kick with something like a toe, it, you can end up getting a blunt penetration of the artery, which will cause a pseudoaneurysm. And the artery is in there. You can't actually feel it. It's extremely painful. And that is one of the Bobishi points that you can't see. The other one I found was in the inside of the arm here. 
Now, you have an artery there, too, which is called the brachial artery. You can, I drew it in here. Yes, it is a continuation of the artery, and it comes here. And again, a, a really hard, blunt, pointed uh, attack there. Maybe you, maybe you could do it with finger attacks, maybe with the um, ipon, you can hit, ipon, you can actually go in there. Or, you know, there are some different finger strikes that people can do. It, is, it might be possible to do the same thing in the artery that a kick would do there. But one of the things that you'll notice is if you are if you have like a GIFA or if you are doing knife fighting, that's a great strike point. You cut that, the person will gush. Has to either decide to go to the hospital and get it taken care of, or you know it would cause relatively a quick death. The other two that I found were in the wrist area. Now, a lot of times people you'll see people and they cut themselves and. It's superficial. It's not going to do anything. It's going to bleed a lot. They're going to go to the hospital and people are going to tell them you're an idiot. Uh, but the truth is, to actually cut the arteries, you have to go pretty deep. Now, the areas are usually around this area here. They can come up to here. The points are actually, I found, were all along this area here, all along this area here. Now, your thumb is here, and the bone that runs this way here is called your radius. The one that runs here with your pinky is called your ulna. And so the artery is your radial artery and your ulnar artery. Now, if you actually press hard enough, you can actually notice that you can feel a pulse along this area and over here. Uh, the other way you can actually do it is if you make a fist, this is called the Allen's fist for anyone who's taken anatomy, and you close off these two arteries, you'll notice that my fingers stay relatively white. When I release one, you'll notice that all of them stay, go pink. If I do the other side, same thing. White, let release it, all of them go pink. And that's, what happens is you have an artery that comes across this way. And those were actually also points that I found were important for uh, the bubishi. These are actually points where, yes, you can potentially hit an artery and cause a lot of damage. There's actually one that they put to, which I mentioned, should mention, is over here, which is the ulnar nerve, which does control a lot of the flexion of the fingers. So if the nerve is cut or damaged, it is, becomes hard to flex your finger. It actually can become impossible, and you can end up having a... Uh, Kind of a hand that comes out like this. The reason is the muscles here can still act with one nerve, but these here are not, so it looks kind of like a claw. And so that, yes, you know, there is a point there. It, a lot of people talk about pain compliance using that. I'm not a big fan of pain compliance because it is, it can fail. The other one is, and this one was actually more of a cut that I saw, which is across here. Now the tendons here, what you're going to cut here is mostly tendons. There is a little bit of a nerve that you might be able to cut. But a cut here causes all these muscles, which are technically called the flexors of the hand, to cease working. In essence, you can no longer make a fist. So your hand stays open like this. You can extend, but you can't come back. Uh, and so that's, that is, like, again, one of the things that I noticed was more specific for knife fighting. Now, there are a, couple, a lot of other nerves. A lot of these nerves are harder to hit. So, for instance, you can't actually hit the ulnar, which is actually relatively easy. The radial tends to be a little deeper and in the back here. But if you can cut it, you can't actually, uh, you won't allow the arms, the hand to open up. But the arteries here are really superficial. Uh, to, actually, you don't really have any arteries on this side. All the arteries are going to be on the inside. And so, for Bubishi, like I said, you really need to look at where you can cause the injuries that would actually be potentially life-threatening. They're there. If you break the bones, again, you can do that, but it becomes extremely hard. And so those are actually the bubishi points for the arms. Next week, I'm going to finish up the bubishi of the legs. And again, what I noticed with the uh, bubishi points is they were more they were more important for uh, bladed weapons or some sort of uh, some sort of well, pretty much uh, penetrating weapon than actually uh, for punching. I mean, like I said, you can potentially use different hands to attack arteries, but it'd be, it'll be a lot harder. Uh, the chest area does tend to be one of the areas that uh, blunt trauma tends to be more, chest and head are the areas that more blunt trauma tends to go to emergency room. And so while you do have these points, how valuable they are is debatable, is, uh, unless you have a weapon. 
set. And that's one of the things I noticed when I was looking at the Babisha points, is it looks like it was more a text to let people know. If you have any penetrating wounds in this area, or if you have wounds in this area, talk to someone who knows something about anatomy. Um, some, usually in that case, it would have been your local uh, doctor, whether it be Chinese medicine or Western medicine. So with that, I will stop and uh, I'll wish you a good day. I don't know. I probably won't have a beard next time, but we'll see. Goodbye.